Welcome back to another episode of Ramiumptum Ruminations. I'm the host, Scott. Today's episode is called The Metaphor of the Archer. Thank you for coming back to listen to another episode. We are now well into the holiday season, just a couple weeks away from Christmas for those that celebrate or still celebrate. And Hanukkah has just ended for those that celebrated that. It's a time of the year where a lot of people come together as families and friends and they interact and they try and be around the ones that they love. And it's even after having left the church, it's still one of my favorite times of the year. Deconstructing my belief in Christ and his literal divinity, I can still appreciate the stories and appreciate the closeness that I feel with my friends and family during this time of year. But that does present some very unique challenges to those of us who have left the church. The hardest struggle for me and for many listeners is how do you interact with your family, your friends, your ward members, your neighbors who used to know you as one person, but now you're someone different? How do you continue to interact with your family who might openly or subtly disagree with you or say unkind things to you behind your back or in front of you? And how do you approach the subject of a faith change to the ones that you love the most? Those conversations, it's been a number of years since I had them, but I still vividly recall how they went with the most important people in my life. I recall exactly how it went with my wife when I spoke to her about it, and with my parents and my siblings. They were very hard conversations. I recently had a listener reach out asking about this particular subject. I had been writing an episode for this, but as I responded to him, I decided that it might be better to release this one before the holidays in anticipation of us getting together with our loved ones, because I think this advice might be helpful for a lot of people. A listener by the name of Ben reached out to me, and he had a number of of very kind things to say about my podcast and the subjects that I address here. And as I said, I had been preparing an episode on this, and so I kind of had right off the bat what I wanted to say. Um, But he asked a question that I think makes a great intro to what I want to discuss. Here's here's a little bit of what Ben said to me in his message. And and again, I'm uh, for confidentiality, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to jump down to the pertinent section. He says, regardless of what happens, I will still keep some of the morals and values conditioned through the church. I'm just worried if I tell those still a part of the organization how I'm feeling about the church, that they won't think of me the same. I don't want a difference in belief to ruin my relationships. And as a result of this anxiety, I haven't told many people about what I'm going through. I was hoping you'd have some advice for this situation. You've mentioned several times that you're in a mixed faith marriage, and I think that's really cool that, you, that you're able to keep that going despite your differences. And I was wondering if you had some insight on how to talk to members of the church about my beliefs and how to interact with them afterwards. So the, the part that I skipped is he talked a little bit about some of the interactions with his loved ones and how they responded to him. I skipped that because I, I didn't, I didn't want to go uh, divulge any of this person's uh, personal details. But it's a great question. How? How can you maintain a relationship with someone that you disagree with? How can you continue to love someone that holds entirely different values than you? To approach this subject, I want to share a stoic metaphor. Now, this metaphor comes from the Stoic philosopher Cicero. Uh, Marcus Tullius Cicero 
lived from the year 106 BC, BCE to about 43 BCE. He was a statesman, a lawyer, a writer, a speaker, and a Stoic philosopher. Now, this particular quote that I'm that I'm going to this particular story, if I recall correctly, he wasn't the first Stoic to bring up this analogy, but he explained it really well in his work on the ends of good and evil. I'll read his analogy of the archer, and then we'll talk about that for the remainder of this episode. This is what Cicero says. Take the case of one whose task it is to shoot a spear or arrow straight at some target. One's ultimate aim is to do all in one's power to shoot straight. And the same applies with our ultimate goal. In this kind of an example, it is to shoot straight that one must do all one can. Nonetheless, it is to do all one can to accomplish the task that is really the ultimate aim. It is just the same with what we call the supreme good in life. To actually hit the target is, as we say, to be selected but not sought. So what does he mean by that? So I'm, I'm going to have to explain a couple of different concepts of Stoicism in order to uh, fully grasp what is being said here. So let's, let's break down a little bit of what he's talking about. He says, the main task of an archer or, or someone throwing a spear is to hit the target. But the ultimate aim is to do everything in your power. The, the question or the focus that he's hitting on here is, which parts of this process are actually in the archer's power? So the things that the archer can control are selecting the right tools, the right bow, making sure the arrow is straight, making sure that he notches it correctly, making sure that he holds his arms in the correct positions, controlling how every step of the way of him, of this archer shooting the arrow is what is in his control. But the moment the arrow leaves the archer, shoots from the bow. It's out of his control. And so what, what Cicero is talking about here is this dichotomy of control that Stoics talk about, and I'll, I'll address that in just a little bit here. But it's this, this concept of the only thing the archer can control is everything until he shoots the arrow. The archer, after the arrow has been shot, cannot control whether or not it hits the intended target. And this archer wants to hit the target. He's done everything in his power, but he can't control the wind or the rain. He can't control if the target falls down. There are countless hypothetical things that could happen during the flight of the arrow towards the target. And none of them are in the control of the archer. So what Cicero is saying here is the archer needs to focus on what he can control. He can desire to hit the target, but the things that he can control are all of the steps leading up to him shooting the arrow and not if he hits the target or not. Now, this is an idea that can be related to so many different aspects of our lives. You know, if, if someone wants to run a successful business, to become a politician, to get that promotion at work, this philosophy applies to every goal we can set. Because every goal we set has elements that we control and elements that we don't control. Let's take, for example, someone who wants to run a successful business. There are a lot of things that a business owner can control. They can control the financials, they can control the expenses, they can control the product that they produce, but there are still a lot of other things that they can't control. 
They can't control negative reviews that people leave about their businesses. They can't control a downturn in the economy or a global pandemic that closed businesses for a number of months. These are things outside of the business owner's control that will impact the success of the business. Oftentimes, Stoics are called fatalistic in the way they look at things because they encourage people to accept fate, um, whether good or bad. It, to me, it's not as fatalistic as it sounds. Let's go with this running a business example. If you're doing everything in your power to run a good business, then you can feel confident and happy that everything on your end was done right. And the things outside of your control, such as a pandemic, while they may cause pain and they may make your business go under, that was something outside of your control. And it didn't have anything to do with the way you ran, the way this hypothetical person ran their business. Now, the same thing goes to this archer. This could be the world's best archer and know every step of the process to shoot the arrow as straight as possible. And the archer might still miss because there are things outside of his or her control. Now this, as I said earlier, is the dichotomy of control. And so I'll explain that briefly before I relate it over to speaking with our families. Most Stoic philosophers talked about this dichotomy, but I'm going to take a quote from Epictetus. Now, uh, side note, none of the writings of Epict Epictetus survive. Everything that we have from him were, was written down by one of his students. Anyway, so here's the quote from, from him. It says, We are responsible for some things, while there are others for which we cannot be held responsible. The former include our judgment, our impulse, our desire, our aversion, and the mental faculties in general. The latter include the body, material possessions, our reputation, status. In a word, anything not in our power to control. The Stoics tried to focus on the things that they could do in their power, and they categorized everything outside of their power that would either be preferred or dispreferred. So back to this archer example or the, the business owner example, the preferred outcome would be hitting the target. But the dispreferred outcome would be not hitting the target or having the business go under. But those things are outside of the archer's control. I mentioned briefly that sometimes Stoics are referred to as fatalistic in their view of having less control over the outcome than they do the process. But that's, that's the whole point. That's the message that they're trying to get across. You could say, well, if it doesn't matter if the archer hit the target or not, why should the archer even worry about shooting at the target in the first place? That's, that misses the whole point. The goal is to hit the target. But the archer needs to recognize which steps of this process are in his or her control. And as we said earlier, the steps in his or her control are everything leading up to firing the arrow, choosing a straight shaft, getting the right fletching, having the, the correct bow, knowing how far back to pull, where to hold it, how to aim it. These are all of the things in the archer's control. And if an archer misses, and let's say it's the wind, the archer can learn from this mistake and say, oh, well, if it's windy and the wind is blowing this direction, I can compensate by firing a little bit in the opposite direction of the wind. The, the process isn't to say that you can't learn from your mistakes and get better. It's to say you need to focus on what you can control. The archer shouldn't say, oh, it was the wind's fault. I'll just wait to fire the arrow until the wind is done. 
on the example of of the target falling over i think i said that one earlier if the target falls over the archer can say oh maybe i need to get better supports for this this target so that it doesn't fall over while i'm firing at it the, the phrase gets often repeated control what you can control and at its heart that is what this stoic philosophy is trying to convey now how can we relate that to our relationships how can we relate that to telling our spouses that we no longer believe in the church or talking to our family after a faith deconstruction? This is it. Control what you can control. Just as the archer, you have control over how you present yourself. You have control over your tone. You have control over the subjects that you talk about. You have control over how delicate you are when you broach subjects that are very important to them. Faith in God, faith in the church, those things are very important to our loved ones that are still in the organization. And for many of them, they will always be in the organization. They will always be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Since leaving the church, there have been many instances where people have reached out to me or said things to me that were hurtful or lacked understanding of the situation. And my immediate response was to get angry and lash out. But what I try and do when possible, is some, of these mess some of these things were written messages, emails, Facebook messages, texts, that sort of thing. So what I do in this sort of a scenario is I write out my response, the thing that I want so desperately to say with no filter. I get all the emotions out and then I stop. I reread it. I let myself simmer and then I delete the whole thing because almost every time that initial message is not what I really want to say to this person. So I come back to it with a better, more caring and loving response. When I'm in person with them, I do my best to maintain a calm, even tone. And I try my hardest not to react because for me, <laughs> my natural reaction is not usually the way that I want to act in situations like this. If I stop and think about it. So that's what I do. I stop and I think, pause, reflect before responding. Make sure that everything you're saying is exactly what you want to say. Let's examine the relationship, a mixed faith marriage or a relationship with a father and a son where one of them has left the church and they're trying to talk to the other or a mother and a daughter, whatever the relationship is, you're interacting with someone you love after you have left the church, you can go about it as perfectly as possible. You can express your love for them. You can express all of the reasons that you left. You can express desires of wanting to stay in, in contact. You can, you can go through every step and have the perfect presentation of why you left. But in this scenario, just as with the archer, that is the extent of what you can control in these relationships. I did not have any control over how my wife responded to me. I had a very close friend who was on the deconstruction path, the religious deconstruction path before me. And he told me his wife was upset with him that she had that he hadn't brought it up earlier when he was going through this process. And so I, from day one, spoke to my wife about my doubts and my concerns. And one of the things that she would say in many of our early conversations is, what's next? What's your next doubt going to be? And it was very, very hard on her, but I did my best to present it in a kind 
and loving way. But all that being said, I have no control over how she responded to me. As she and I have matured in our love and in our relationship, one of the phrases that we say to each other now is that we choose each other. And, and this goes right to that same concept. I love my wife. I try to do the things that I know will make her happy. But unless she chooses me back, we can't have a fulfilling relationship. And I can't control whether or not she chooses me back. All that I can control is how I treat her. And I, <laughs> I quickly learned that the way I presented my doubts and concerns impacted the way our conversations went. If I was flippant or if I laughed at things that I thought were funny, it would put her off and she would immediately close up and we wouldn't have a good conversation. But if I was delicate, if I was thoughtful, then she opened up and we were able to have really good conversations about these very uncomfortable subjects. Now, I share my experience with my wife because it was the best outcome that I could have ever dreamed of. Our relationship grew, our love grew after having deconstructed religion, but her staying in, it, it forced us to learn how to communicate and we're both better off for it. But that wasn't the case with many of my other relationships. I think I've said before, but I'm, I'm pretty introverted. So in person, when I interact with, with family and friends, I'm usually the quiet one. I sit and I listen. And with my siblings, I decided that if I was going to be able to communicate everything, I needed to write it down. And so I wrote down all my thoughts and then I deleted the message, as I said earlier, and I wrote it down again. And the second time I was a lot more thoughtful, a lot more caring. For, honestly, the email that I sent off to my entire extended family, it didn't say a lot. It didn't give reasons. I didn't give justifications or excuses. All I said was, I still love you all. I've made a decision for my life. And I hope that this decision doesn't impact our relationship. And for the most part, it hasn't. I, I sent that. I didn't know how I was, what response I was going to get. But the very first message I got was from one of my brothers. And it, it brought me to tears. Now, this brother I already did have a good relationship with. And I had discussed some of these things with him prior to this conference, to this email. So he, I think he had an inkling more than some of the others. But he, he and his wife both reached out to me immediately and said, we love you. You're still our brother, no matter what. And that was an excellent moment. But that wasn't... <laughs> That wasn't the entire reception that I got from this message. In fact, that was the outlier, if you will. There were others that, re that responded kindly. There were others that didn't respond. And there were others that responded poorly. Back to this metaphor of the archer. I didn't shoot multiple arrows or give a different message to different siblings or different people in my family. It was the same message. But I got a wide variety of responses to it. But I controlled what I could in this situation. I controlled how I presented it. I controlled how thoughtful and kind I was to their perspective and to their feelings. I set boundaries and I set where I stood firmly. But it wasn't on me how they responded to it. One of the hardest things for me to grapple with as an adult um, with some of my familial relationships. Now, some of them were strained before my faith deconstruction and leaving the church did not help that. But one of the things 
that I really struggled with was, and this is me being vulnerable for a minute, and, and I think this will be helpful to listeners as they're getting ready to go into the holiday season and, and meet with their families. I dreaded visiting certain people because I knew exactly how the conversation would go. I knew things that would be brought up. I knew that I would get offended and upset. I knew that when I was offended and upset, I wouldn't say kind things or I would have to shut my mouth and go cool off before I could even speak properly to people. And I struggled with even having the desire to maintain a relationship with some people. And it wasn't until I studied stoicism, understood these concepts better, that I have adjusted the way I approach scenarios like this. There's a tradition in my family where they reenact the Matthew and Luke birth narratives of Christ. And for a while, that was really frustrating for me to listen to because all I could hear were the inconsistencies and the contradictions in the stories. And it took me away from being able to enjoy my family. And as I tried to learn from this metaphor of the archer and from the, the dichotomy of control, I try and go into these situations with a different mindset. I know things will come up that will upset me and will offend me. But the only thing I can control is how I respond to them. I know that, that they're going to present the nativity and I'm going to watch my children acting out the different roles. So I get to choose how I respond to this. Instead of being upset, instead of getting angry, I can choose how I want to interact with these people. Because I can control me. I can stay level-headed. I can choose how I react to them. I can let my love for them dictate my actions. Or I can let my, fr my frustration with the situation control how I respond. I can love them and disagree with them. I can love them, disagree with them, and choose when to be vocal about it and when to stay quiet about it. I can love them and appreciate their beliefs, even though they're different than mine. And I can support them in their beliefs, even though I disagree with them. With the caveat that, you know, unless these beliefs are harmful, and uh, I feel like I have spoken out on a number of those prior to this, so that might be clear already. But the point of all this is that we can control how we interact with our families and our friends and our loved ones and our neighbors and the members of the ward, but we can't control how they react to us. We would prefer them to all be accepting and loving and kind, but we, we don't get to choose that. The only thing that we have power over is how we interact with them. That doesn't make it easy. Doesn't make it fun all the time. <laughs> But that's nothing compared to leaving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've done tough things before. And I'll do tough things again. I do love my family, even if sometimes they hurt me unknowingly. And I'm sure that I've hurt them unknowingly as well. As I said at the outset of this, I love the holiday season. People are typically nicer. They're buying gifts for each other. You know, I know it's commercialized and I do have my complaints there, but we're being thoughtful. And what better time of the year to practice kindness with our loved ones, especially those that we disagree with. I haven't decided if I'm going to post any new episodes the week of Christmas and the week after. I have um, some family things going on. So I, I can't promise that the next two weeks I'll have episodes, but starting the new year, I'll get back on track with the weekly episodes. I do have some pre-recorded, but they're not edited yet and they're not holiday themed. <laughs> and I kind of feel bad putting out uh, an episode the week of Christmas that's not holiday themed. And for those in the future listening back, this is uh, December 2021. Um, if you're listening to this when it's come out, uh, the last week of the year, I will not have a new episode and the new episodes will resume 
starting, I think it's the third. That's a Monday of 2022. Happy holidays. I hope you go and have some excellent food, enjoy some great company, and spend time with the people that you love. And maybe, maybe reach out to that someone that you don't get along with, that you loved a long time ago, but that you're angry with. Maybe this is the year to try and mend the relationship. Maybe this is the year to, to move past some of the hurt. Now I'm saying that into this microphone, but, but really that's for me. And for any listener that that resonates with too, I guess. Because there are people in my life that I, I want to have a better relationship with. Happy holidays. Stay safe, drink responsibly, and have fun with those that you love. So from me, from Scott, with Remy Emptum Ruminations, to you all, have an excellent Christmas and holiday season, and I will see you next year. Oh, <laughs> and as always, I hope that you have an excellent day. <laughs>